get their attention off the bottom. You know, I mean, what we're throwing a lot of times is up above their heads. And if they're feeding on the bottom grubbing to get them to like say, hey, you know what, let's look up for a minute. Those fish are doing what they're doing for a reason. Um, and, 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 and this comes with a lot of different types of, of fishing, not necessarily a sand eel bite. There are times when those fish are grubbing lobsters, crabs, and you can throw every plug in the world, you know, 10 feet above them. And if they don't want to come up, they're not coming up. Welcome to the Surfcasters Journal Night Fishing Podcast. Our mission is to share our passion of surf fishing by bringing you interviews and conversations with some of the sport's most fascinating people. I am your host, Zenoff Roman, co-founder of Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com, book author, and of course, an avid surfcaster. So let's jump right into today's episode. It's my pleasure today to have Dennis Zambrata here. He is the author of Surfcasting Around the Block. He's been fishing for a long time. You can find him at Saltwater Edge Tackle Store once in a while where he's enjoying his retired life. So welcome to the show, Dennis. Thank you very much, Z. I know you have spent a lot of times over the years fishing a sand deal bite, as they call it. What is this something that... that what is the first thing that comes to your mind when somebody tells you a sand eel? Uh, you know, slim baits, striped bass, um, and sometimes uh, they get so selective. Uh, most of my great sand eel bites are after dark. I, you know, I mean, that would, that would be my one, uh, you know, piece of advice to people that see big, big clouds of sand eels in the daylight. And if you can't get fish to bite and you know they're there, just come back after dark. It makes it so much easier. I find that to be uh, one of the most important things because it can be a very frustrating bite, especially if you see sand deals and fish and you throw in pencil poppers and, and nothing's touching it. But you know what? Let's just kind of run through the whole experience of sand eel bite let's start with the beginning of the season because you you technically you have a two sand eel bites you have your spring sand eel bite and you have your fall sand eel bite right so exactly let's, let's let's do the spring one let's let's start off the, the spring all right the spring ones are basically um a bite that i get uh here in newport if they're going to happen they generally will happen from anywhere the end of the first week of June to maybe the first week of July. And um, the thing about the spring bite here in, in Rhode Island is, is you're, you're talking mostly uh, uh, juvenile size sand eels, which are very, very small, um, maybe two inches, three inches max. Um, and as you know, I mean, when, when striped bass are on that size bait, especially clouds of that size bait, they can get very, very, very selective. I mean, it, you'd almost need a stick of dynamite in daylight to, to you know, to get your bass. Um, but, you know, when that happens, um, you know, it's, it's a struggle uh, sometimes, unless you get good white water, good white water helps. But if it's flat ass calm, like it generally is in the summertime, you know, it's going to be a struggle and you got to use small stuff. You got to use uh, subtle presentations again to get them in the daylight. But what I found here in Newport is, is if you know the sand eels are there, I mean, and it's, it's not that hard to find out because all you got to do is drive around and you see the birds going nuts um, is to then go to those areas after dark. And if those sand eels stay in on the beach, are close enough for you to access them, um, you can get some really good fishing because the fish generally after dark um, will be a little, a lot more receptive to uh, hitting artificials and or teasers 
Um, and then, you know, if you're really in, in bad cahoots, you, you use rig deals and, uh, and those fish will bite those. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the spring sand eel bite is, is, a, is a lot different than uh, what you get in the fall, for sure. Well, well, two observations there. First of all, uh, using a rig deal is always a good idea. That's oh. no matter what's going on. Yeah. And the second thing is, is that what you would call a telltale sign of a sand eel bite? Uh, that would be the diving of the birds? In uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I mean, the birds diving obviously give, give bait away, um, give fish and bait away. Um, and then you know, just from experience, knowing what time of year it is, I can generally say, yeah, th this is when the sand eels should be here. That's probably what they are. After dark, you, it, it leaves no doubt, because if you find them pushed up on the beach, they're all over the place. I mean, you walk into a knee deep water and you, you, you can just, I mean, I've been in instances where I've, I've walked on, on some sand beach around here where I walk in knee deep, waist deep, and there are striped bass feeding all around my legs. I mean, they don't give a crap. They are just grubbing in the sand. There's sand eels all over the place. They're washing up on the beach. Um, and, and it's the, one of the few times where I find that um, striped bass don't mind you wading in around with them. They just kind of, they just move out of the way. They move out of the way, you walk through them, and then they fill in behind you as you kick up sand. It's it's some of the most amazing, uh, you know, uh, footage that I've ever seen, really. Well, what, what you're saying is that oftentimes on a sand deal bite, and, and, and I'm sorry if I'm paraphrasing you, but it means that we are overcasting the fish. In, in some cases, I mean, there are, you know, those instances when they're out at the end of your cast. Um, but if the sand deals feel comfortable and they want to be in the sand, which is generally, you know, close to you, uh, they, they generally, uh, will come right in and, and that's where they're, you know, you, you got to remember they're feeding too. So, I mean, they're, they're looking to eat and, you know, the whole chain or, you know, uh, the food chain goes, goes into effect, you know, it's them coming in to feed on phytoplankton or whatever, and the bass are right behind them, you know, and, uh, and um, you know, there's one phenomenon uh, that we witness here in, uh, in Newport is um, we'll have those sand eels like all night up in the beach, bass in them, and then right at first light, all those sand eels seem to um, all come out of the sand and they just get into these big clouds. I mean, they just get really, really close together, big clouds, and you see them on top of the water. And then they'll just swim out to deep water they, and they disappear. The fish are with them. They're, they're, you'll see the, the swirls and, and splashes and then they disappear. And then we have to wait until dark again for those things to come back into the beach. And uh, it's it's kind of an interesting phenomena. That uh, joining into a crowd, supposedly uh, most bait fish do that for their own protection. So yeah, yeah. They can't be picked out. Does does that change the bite at dawn? Does it does it help or does it uh, make it even harder? As soon as it gets light out, those it's over. fish they, it, those fish are hard to fool. They're still there. They're still there. I mean, uh, they, they prove it. I mean, they're swirling and everything else. Once it gets a little bit light out, um, uh, the bite at times becomes almost impossible. You know, speaking of, of which, and, and I'll go back to the retrieve and a distance from the beach, but in the fall, and, and this is my personal observation. I've heard this from many other people over the years. You know, you have your bait migrations where the peanut bunker or bunker or herring will move down the beach and you're fishing here. And, you know, the bite was here. You can go down 10 miles tomorrow thinking about it. With sand deals, it doesn't work like that. With sand deals, it seems to sand deals move from deep water into shallow water and then they move back to the deep water with the temperature. And that's it. Like you can be waiting three miles south. They're never coming. Yeah. If you don't go where the sand deals are, you're not on the sand deal bite. Exactly. I mean, you do have to do a little bit of searching, you know, I mean, I mean, you look at Cape Cod, which is basically 
you know, sand eel central. You know, I mean, if you have so much beach there to, uh, to, to search for your bait fish. Um, you know, one of the best lessons I ever got, you know, uh, fishing was, is one of the few times I was out with Tony Stetsko out on the Cape. Um, as you know, Tony was very, very in touch with the whole natural, uh, the natural cycle of things. So Tony, you know, I was in, in a truck with him with a friend of mine that knew Tony really well. And we're driving along and every bar that Tony would come to, he would jump out of the truck, he would run into the water, in knee deep water and he'd start shuffling his feet with his light on. If he didn't see any sand eels coming out from the sand, he's got next bar. We'd drive down, we'd go another half mile, he'd jump out of the truck. And then all of a sudden he'd go, yep, right here. No shit. Yeah, I mean, it was just, an you know, and that, that's why, you know, there's very, very few people that are that in touch with the whole cycle of life that, that they're interested in. But he was one of them for sure. I mean, he knew exactly what was going on everywhere he fished. And he wouldn't fish places where there wasn't any life. You know? He was great. I, oh, I yeah. remember him and, and such a shame to be part of such a young age. Did he hmm. ever share with you why would they at certain spots and not others? At least his well, yeah, thoughts? I mean, you know, I mean, it, his idea was they, you know, they bed down in the sand for, you know, either to feed or to stay in that area to feed later. Or again, you'd, you'd almost have to be, a, you know, a sandy or marine biologist to understand why they sometimes stay in, in water that's 200 feet deep and, and why they sometimes hit the beach. Right, because I mean, when you to be fair, the the, the sand eels are primarily bait, primary bait for codfish at one oh, point during the winter, right? They're, they're, and they're, many other fish. There are, I mean, whales, everything, everything. I mean, they are. Uh, you know, you can't just peg a sand eel as being a uh, a, a shallow water or a littoral area fit. You know, bait or a deep water bait, because they're both, and you and they're so hard to predict. You know, even on Black Island, when I go to Black Island in the fall, some years you got them, some years you don't, and you don't know why. And uh, only the sand hill knows for sure. <laughs> but to, to, to be fair, yeah. to be fair, the other, the other side of that coin is that yeah, yeah. when you do find them, boy, they stay. You, you can almost yeah, yeah. set your clock to them. Oh, well, especially if you can actually see them. I mean, a lot of us will speculate, hey, you know, the bite's good, they're probably out there. You know, but when you start, you know, snagging them on treble hooks of your needlefish, or seeing them actually washed up in the rack line, uh, that gets me really excited. When I see right. a sand deal washed up, I, I know I'm in, in like Flint. Exactly. And, and the other thing is, like I said, I mean, if you're on a bite that's a herring or bunker, they might be gone tomorrow. They might be 10, be 10 miles down the beach. The, the sand deals, um, until they're gone, and, and my experience is once they're gone, you, it's done. Yeah, but yeah. They're gone, they're gone. But, you know, I mean, depending on the wind conditions, that matters a lot how the bite is any particular night. So that's a whole other thing. But, you know, when you get on a sand, one of my point is it, it's a really consistent bite once it happens, okay, once you find them. Now, having said that, you just touched on it. What would you consider the best lures to be for the sand eel bite? <sighs> on nighttime, it, you know, it's, it's hard to beat a needlefish. Um, it's, it's, it's what I learned uh, out on block when I first started to go out there because, you know, at the time when I first started fishing out there, uh, the prevalent bait fish in the surf out there was sand eels. And, and it was big, big sand eels. You know, it was bigger than the two or three inch sand eels that we, we generally get in the spring here. Um, and, you know, the needlefish ended up fitting the bill as far as being uh, uh, a slim profile, uh, cast really good for Block Island, which is a shallow, it tends to be shallow. 
uh, especially if you're, you know, shorebound or in waders. I mean, you're not expanding your horizons in a wetsuit, which is a completely different game out there. Um, but um, it, it was the it was the correct tool for the job that and and all of the minnow plugs, uh, you know, rebels, red fins, bombers, um, anything slim seemed to get the job done out there. And uh, um, I mean, you can still catch fish on a bottle plug or a darter or that, but uh, you know, when they're when they're um, when you're keyed in on on a slim profile, uh, the needlefish definitely seem to to do the do the trick. And and I use uh, needles and and uh, plastic lip swimmers predominantly during a sandio bite. Plus, I use droppers. Uh, you know, when you start playing around in daylight, I tend to try and use um, uh, bucktails that are sparsely tied. Um, you know, one of the weirdest things I ever had happen to me was in a big sandy old bite on Block Island, daylight, and I said, oh, I'll just throw a bucktail on. So I threw on, you know, Andrus bucktails, like the big jetty casters with the big fluffy hair they would not bite that damn thing. I mean, I was dragging that thing right through them and, and it was unbelievable. I had another bucktail that was sparsely tied, a little bit of white hair on it, um, slim line head, would throw that thing out there and they were on at every cast. It, uh, it, it was, it's, you know, profile counts when they're selective. Um, the other thing, you know, obviously to use would be, uh, would be to use tins. Uh, hop, you know, Hopkins No Equal is the two ounce model uh, with a white tube was always a classic killer on block. It's still a classic killer out there. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people, I don't know why, you know, people that use diamond jigs with a tube get the Guggen, you know, moniker thrown at them. But to be fair, the, the diamond jigs are designed to be I vertically know, jigged. Know. I, I I am not looking down. It, listen, yeah. if you're catching fish on your mother's spoon with a hook, I don't give a Me shit. Me neither. Me okay, neither. Good you know? for you. Good for you. You know, you you actually made an effort to get out of your bed and get yeah. onto the beach. And you know what? I give you all the credit. So I'm yeah. not going to look down on you. But to be fair, the, the jigs are not really designed to be retrieved correctly because they're designed up and down that's the whole diamond shape you got the four sides of the flash for you so this is this is why they get a bad rap i don't think it's because of their fish catching abilities speaking of which i wanted to touch base on you before you forget because before you move on to another topic is that you mentioned about sparsely tied bucktail but you never told me if there was a trailer or not behind no that bucktail straight. also no just a bare straight, bucktail. Straight bucktail yep Straight naked. naked bucktail. Wow. Again, um, sometimes. You know, it takes a lot of confidence <laughs> for to throw a naked bucktail. You know, I give you a lot of yeah, props yeah. for I that mean, one. You know, uh, it, it's just something that that I I I've done all my life anyway. I mean, you know, I learned when I was a kid. I used to we used to get the peanut bunker schools, and um, back then there was a, a Hopkins had this. Uh, uh, flathead lima bean shaped uh, jig head and white hair, it, it was a chrome head and, and I think they called them hammer tails. And oh my God, that thing just thrown into the peanut bunker stools because sometimes they're real selective on peanut bunker. And that thing without a pork rind, without any kind of trailer um, was like amazing. And I always use it sans uh, a trailer. Um, and, and, and the funny thing is, is I used to bucktail a lot of bridges uh, when I first started also. And I found that uh, early, early in the season, now I'm talking like, you know, mid-May around here is, is, is fairly early. Uh, I could do a lot of damage in the shadow lines on bridges with bucktails with no pork rind. Once the water temperature warmed up, to maybe what it would be in, in mid-June, you needed a pork rind. Otherwise, you, they would not touch. But, you know, it could be that the forage changed too because then you got a lot of squid coming in, blah, 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 you know. Oh, you yeah, have some yeah, yeah. In but but in the beginning yeah, of the too. year, I would bucktail the shadows without a pork rind. 
Well, that kind of reminds me, like after Christmas, I try to eat really healthy. It lasts about two weeks <laughs> until I get to the bigger foods. So I guess the bass <laughs> does the same thing when the season rolls yeah, around. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, going back to the red gills, and, and I know we haven't touched on this, but they are really, I mean, if you're going to argue what is the closest imitation of a sand deal, it's red gill. And I believe where you work at Seth Waller's Edge, Peter is like the only guy that import them, right? Right from England. Yeah, right? I mean, he is that um, what the original. He for a while. I don't know if he still is, but he was like, um, he became like the U.S. distributor for them. Uh, right. They were deadly lures. They in are sand still bite. deadly on sand eel bites. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I mean, you can get away with feathers. I, I mean. You know, I've I've been using droppers since I learned about them in um, in an old book, uh, a complete book of a uh, striped bass fishing by Hal Lyman and Frank Frank No Hal Lyman and Frank Wilner. Yeah, Frank. Okay. So um, so they ended up in their book. They talked about um, using uh, how striped bass fishermen started using like a bucktail and things behind a lure at first then a, apparently there was a couple guys that decided you know what maybe if you put something in front of a lure it might work a little bit better and their reasoning was is there there's a, in fly fishing there's a uh, a lot of times when you fly fish you use a dropper fly in front of your main fly when you're drifting in in rivers and streams and to give the fish two options so their reasoning was like you know what we're going to give the fish two options but anyway they, they first started using in front of lures uh, a bear hook with a piece of pork rind on it of all things as the dropper and that's huh. what i started using and it worked the only thing i the problem i started having is is that it tends to fold over the point of the hook the pork rind which we all know happens occasionally with bucktails too but, uh, and then from there, I went to feathers, uh, you know, bucktail and then feathers. And then when the red gill came out, I mean, that just completely revolutionized the dropper. Uh, when, when I found out about that and started using those, it was just like, uh, you know, it's hard to go back to, uh, to feathers. But there's a lot of people out there now that do a real nice job with feathers uh, and real, make really, really nice uh, sand eel imitations as a dropper. I would also assume that if you tied anything behind the lure, that your ability to set the hook would be totally yeah. different than it would be in front of the. You mean? Lure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do. You know, in, in Rhode Island, you've got the uh, the old egg with the bucktail on it. Uh, people have been using that forever. Right, right. I started playing around with a pencil popper doing the same thing. I took the hooks off a pencil popper. I put a nail in its side, like a, an old Gibbs and would hang bucktails off it. And, uh, and, and, and you're right. The strike feels a little bit different. Um, you know, you'll be reeling it in and then all of a sudden you feel like a little weight there and you're not feeling that wrap, you know? And um, so it's a little bit different, but it's a, it's a, it's a method that, this year, I've really started to experiment on throwing different things behind the egg. I've started to use like uh, big sluggos. I I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I don't generally get a lot of distance with and to see if I can then put that item in areas I could never reach before with a casting egg. And I started, oh, yeah, I started playing around with a lot of soft plastics, nine inch sluggos of all things. I started hanging them on the egg and whipping them out there to see if I can get any more distance to an unweighed sluggo that I would, you know, normally get. And I was, and, and, and I've been encouraged. I mean, I'm still learning what works and what doesn't, but, um, but anyway, it's, it's, a, it's another trick in, in the book um that people can use and uh i mean i'd recommend anybody try it i mean those casting eggs people are really starting to get good with them they're 
chase some false albacore with them. Well, I'm going to tell you how I got my ass kicked with that. <laughs> okay, so, so for everyone to know, we were at a Cuddy Hunk uh, years ago. I think McKenna was with me. And there was this fellow from Rhode Island. I think his name was Dick. He was there with his son. The guy was well in his 70s. And uh, I was catching fish on a bucktail in a, on a hard southwest wind on Southwest Point. But the problem was is that it's so shallow that I just, if I wasn't going to get a fish on the first two cranks, I was oh, going to yeah. get right down in the weed. And, and I was in a wetsuit out in the rock, and he had this bu white bucket, white boots, <laughs> a casting egg, and a half an ounce bucktail. And, and he was casting where I was standing, literally, and he got like 30 <laughs> fish in a row. Yeah. While I just looked at him, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But, you know, this is, this is where the experience comes in. I mean, the man has been doing it for 30 years, and I definitely got school right there, and I saw the possibility. Oh, yeah, that's so Lower presentation. I, I mean, you can't, you can't match that. So, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of variants to it. You know, you get distance, you get slower present. You can crawl a bucktail along with that, depending on what kind of lead you've got. Because that, that egg is going to keep that bucktail off the, off yeah. the bottom at any point. You does, doesn't matter what you yeah. do with it. It's not, I mean, I've used, you know, um, casting eggs with, dead eels in boulder fields so you know how it's hard to get a, you know an eel through a boulder field sometimes you know bubble weed this bubble weed that you can hang that baby on an egg and you got a two feet drop off of that you're almost like using that eel with a bobber and you just you can just crawl that thing through there and you know those fish are in there uh but it's hard to present anything in there but an eel on a single hook would be one thing you could do. Although this year we're going to have to play around with circle hooks. So it's, it's a whole new yeah, ball game. I've already had big discussions about uh, that today. So. I, I'm not sure how yeah. I feel about rig deals yeah. and circle hooks, yeah, but I we know. have no choice. And this is what, yeah. what we dealt with. And I'm not going to recommend no one to yeah. skirt the law. It is what it is. Yeah, we yeah. all got to deal with it. Uh, going back to to the the structure and and not necessarily the structure itself, but 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 the conditions. Do you find that certain conditions work better for the sand eel bite than others? Meaning rough surf versus flat. I mean, I know you already said the nighttime is the nighttime key. is the key. Um, I've caught fish in all sorts of conditions with sand eels. It's it really depends yeah, on the structure, right? it really I mean, does. it's like the current. It, it really it really depends. Like if, if you have a sandy beach, maybe a little bit of a surf, it's mm -hmm. probably a God-given thing, you know, depending yeah, on the time yeah. of the yeah. year. I, I, think, I think anytime you have surf, it gives cover to what you're throwing and cover for the bass. I mean, um, again, it's, it, it, you know, what you're throwing is maybe not quite as discernible to them as it would be on a full moon flat night where they can look at what you're throwing. I mean, who knows how many times you get people, you know, I mean, people fish to follow what you're throwing and you have no idea that they're following it every cast. You have no idea. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you put a little bit of wind chop or something there and it makes all the difference in the world. You know, I, I think it, it, it helps fool them. I also feel, and I don't know if you'll agree with this, on a sand debate, this, hmm. this, particular, this particular works on sand, is that if you have a little bit of a churn, it's usually beneficial hmm. to unearth oh, yeah. those sand deals, you know, where you have some white water over the ball, where the flat conditions can be sometimes a very, very picky, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, the bite. times that I've, I've had uh, tough bites after dark with uh, sand deals in the wash has been... Um, when, when, when you, you can see their tails sticking up out of the water, it may be tough, uh, to get them to, to get their attention off the bottom. You know, I mean, what we're throwing a lot of times is up above their heads. And if they're feeding on the bottom grubbing to get them to like, say, Hey, you know what? Let's look up for a minute. Those fish are doing what they're doing for a reason. Um, and, 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 and this comes with a lot of different types of, of fishing, not necessarily a sand eel bite. There are times when those fish are grubbing lobsters, crabs, and you can throw every plug in the world, you know, 
10 feet above them. And if they don't want to come up, they're not coming up. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you something opposite. I've experienced over the years where you have a mullet bite and they're looking up. You can have all the bait you want on the bottom that's and true. they're not looking that's at true. it. That's true. You know, and it's a very frustrating oh, bite, uh, uh, bait, bait fishing when it's a mullet run. Or even sand I know I'll give you good. one instance. You know, uh, you know the, the, the big block runs at, on Block Island um, of sand eel bites and big fish. You know, I mean, I fished, I fished a lot of them. And there were nights where, you know, you, you'd have a lineup of guys that were plugging. And at the end of the lineup, you had a few guys that would be chunking. All right, they'd have either mackerel on the bottom or squid or pogey or whatever. And those guys were catching dogfish on the chunks, but everybody that had a plug on was, 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 was just catching these bass left and right. But there are other times when those fish are grubbing for something on the bottom, whether it be, like you said, you know, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, crabs or lobsters or whatever. And you can't get them with a plug, but the guys that are chunking just get one after the other, one after the other. It's, it, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we have to be versatile if you want to do it um, and get in on this. But my personal opinion is that, the, and I fish bait over the years plenty of times, but my, my personal opinion is that the bait always worked better when there wasn't a lot of exactly. bait around. Yep. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Fishing bait was all because the, your thing was the only yeah. food around, yeah. literally. When you had a lot of bait around, I never done as well as bait. Plus, I guess I always felt like, hey, listen, I can catch them on plugs. Why the hell would I want to throw bait? Which is, you know, it personal is, it choice is, yeah. to anyone. Yeah, it is. Spe speaking back to the lures, we never touched on colors. Talk to me about colors. Well, Well, hold, 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 hold on a second. Hold on. Before you go any too far, hold on a second. Everybody does this when you talk to them. People almost feel a need to apologize for what they use. <laughs> I want to know what yeah. you use. I don't give a yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, what yeah. other people use. I don't care what general sense is. If you like a pistachio <laughs> plug, that's so true. be it. So that's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. asking you. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I generally, if like I'm using sandals? needlefish, I basically am using... Uh, light colors, I, I, obviously a Block Island green or a bright green. I love the, uh, the bright green. Uh, I'm using yellow and I'm using white. Um, pretty much stick to those three because I know what I'm doing with those three. And I'll use those in all sorts of different moon uh, phases. Uh, where it does change a little bit for me is... Um, during the bright moon, I generally shy away from, um, the solid dark colors. Um, and I'll just continue to use the white, I mean, the whites, the greens, the yellows, but sometimes during a, a, a dark moon or a new moon, um, I will, depending on how they're biting, I will stick with solid dark colors, either a black or a, or a blurple or something to that effect. And that's, that's what I was saying. It's kind of more of a, a, a that's kind of a traditional uh, uh, general rule. And, and that's kind of way I stick. But, but you're right. I mean, uh, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, there, there are going to be times when they're on pink. And I've used pink really, really uh, uh, with real good effectiveness at times. And, uh, and but generally, you know, that happens because I've got a partner that's telling me, you know what, pink was really, really good last night. So, I mean, I'm not afraid to go any which way with color. Well, well, the only reason I said that is because a lot of times when you talk, you know, not necessarily in a podcast, but when you talk to people, like everybody wants to tell you when they do the seminar, well, in general sense, you use this and that. Here's a perfect example. I remember uh, a new moon night, and we were on a rock, and I had a bunch of fish, and I, I'm coming off. I was, I was wetsuit, and I'm coming off the rock, and another guy comes off. And it turns out this guy is a lot better fisherman than I was. And he goes, what the fuck? You had a fish in every cast. He goes, I couldn't buy a fish. I said, what did you have him on? I'm like, white daughter. He goes, white daughter? 
it's new moon. That's the only plug I don't have in my bag. Why would you take a white dog? I have no idea. I had confidence. I, I, I hooked a fish on the first cast and I kept throwing it. So I guess my, my question to you is, is, is something that I ask most other people, and this has nothing to do with sand deals. How much do you think or how much, what, what's your feeling on a confidence on using what you know to work for you? Like, how important this is to you? If I took your whatever color, whatever, let's just say a yellow daughter, and I changed that with, uh, with another color daughter in a, from another maker, would this, like, kill your confidence completely? To uh, some you extent? know what? It could. And, and that's, you know, that's obviously confidence. You, you, you know, you're bringing that up. Um, makes everyone realize that confidence is huge. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge factor in, in, um, in fishing, especially if you're, you're in a lineup and, you're, and, and you don't have what everybody's fishing and it's a, and it's a color difference. Um, I, I've seen it happen on Block Island where guys are willing to you know, spend you know, $100 for a damn plug because they didn't have one. Um, it's, Confidence is huge. Um, I'm, I'm fine if I don't have a white darter and one guy is catching them, but I have a yellow or I have a, you know, a beige or a silver ghost or, you know, uh, you know, super strike darter. I, as long as I had one like that and it wasn't a solid black, um, I think I'd be all right. I'd say, you know what, I, you know, I, I know how to fish these things. It shouldn't make that much difference. And if it does, well, you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I, what I'm yeah. trying to get across to some maybe people that yeah. are getting into the sport that it's usually the pilot and not oh, yeah. the airplane. Yep. Yep. It is. It is. If you um, if you know what you're doing and you're confident about it, um, you should be able to... You'll catch your, you'll yeah, catch your you should be fish. able to drill out a few fish, you know. Uh, hey, listen, getting off the couch is 90% of the is. job. Especially on those cold November nights, and you know this as oh, well as I do. You know, I, I just got through fishing a week in, on block, uh, you know, two weeks ago, and um, we had a couple cold nights, and then it got to be where it was seventy degrees. I mean, and the cold, nasty nights were the better nights, you know. And I kept saying, "Oh man, it's really going to get good now that it's like sixty degrees at night." And those really, really nice nights sucked. You know, it's it's so weird how that happens. You know, when you you you, you just think you're going to do damage, you know, because you're going to be comfortable, and it doesn't happen. And then you then you go, wow, I wish I had one of those nights when my hands were cold. You know, so I I take it. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I, I understand all of that. I understand the pain of cold and and, and the swatting of mosquitoes in August, hoping yeah, it gets yeah. cold. You know, all of that and, and, and all of that has its own little great and, and yeah. bad points. But what one last thing is the not only the retrieve itself, but also the distance. Give me some thoughts on, on both. When, it's, when it comes primarily to sand Yeah, deals. sand deals are... There are going to be times, um, especially I learned this from Block, where they're going to be at the end of your cast. Uh, you know, I, there's, and I've I've talked to uh, plenty of uh, my friends who uh, who live out there who who um, who fish a lot from a kayak, and they're out there and they go, oh man, Dennis, he said there's fish out here. They're you know two or three casts off the beach. And they're just clouds and clouds and clouds of sand deals, you know, and then you've, you know, you have those instances where you get out on a rock and you bomb a, you know, a needlefish, which is a good casting plug. And you get like two or three turns of it. And you get fish on those first two or three turns of the handle and then nothing for the next, you know, you know, 45 seconds. So you, you, you learn that, hey, you know what, I'm wasting, I'm wasting all this time because those fish are not in close. Um, there are going to be times when they're out at the end of your cast. And, uh, and you know, there's going to be times when they're out past the end of your cast and you'll never, ever know it, especially after dark. Um, but as far as retrieves are concerned, 
Um, I generally, with, with needlefish, you got to play around with them. Um, I generally will cast it out and start reeling it in. I mean, people say you get bored. I don't get bored fishing needlefish. I mean, it's slow, but to me, I mean, in most applications after dark, you should be going slow with just about everything you're throwing, plugging wise. Um, the only exception sometimes is with eels, with the rig deals, like rig deals, I'll move a little quicker than I would a plug. But with plugs, I mean, I'm pretty much putting out a pretty slow, pre and I was kind of taught that way to kind of keep things slow at night. Now, with super strike needles, sometimes I, um, I try to skip them at night, but basically I'm doing that to try and draw those fish up. Um, that's what I think I'm doing. You know, I'll go, I'll cast out, the thing will hit the water, I'll, I'll take in the slack and I will give it like three or four like quick sweeps of the rod um, to get that needle fish to just slide across the surface and make a commotion. Then I slow it down. And then I slow it down for maybe five or 10 turns and I do it again, swish that thing across the surface and we call it skipping. And I had a, uh, a Rhode Island guy teach me that years ago. And uh, he said, you don't skip super strikes? And I go, skip super strikes? He goes, yeah, you got to skip them at night. And, and it's kind of an interesting uh, tactic that I learned from him. And, and I was astounded because I'd go out there on flat calm nights, cast that thing way the hell out, start skipping it. And as soon as I slowed it down and took up my slack, I mean, the, the, the strikes were explosive. And I, and, you know, I think what was happening was is these fish were otherwise not very active, but it was a way to get them to, uh, again, I, I go back to my roots in freshwater bass fish, it's a reaction strike. Um, a lot of times you got to, you know, change things up to get a reaction strike and um, make them pissed off, make them notice that it's up there, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, the first, the first step of catching a fish is having them notice what you're throwing. That's always been my, uh, my motto. So, you know, I mean, throwing a four and a half inch rebel into a, a maelstrom of surf, you know, it's gonna really be hard for that fish to find that plug, you know, but if you can throw a, a profile into a really rough sea and you can get, at least get the fish to know it's there, they may not hit it, but at least get them to know it's there, you have a shot, you know, is the way I look at it. Um, but but for the most part, my needlefish uh, retrieves are, are fairly slow. Uh, you know, a twitch here, a twitch there. I, it, there's 800,000 needlefish out there, <laughs> types of needlefish out there now. They all probably have a way to be fished. And my God, I, I could never figure, it, figure them all out. So I pick a couple, you know, I, I use a Gibbs, I use a Super Strike, I use, uh, you know, an After Hours. I mean, I use an old Habs. Um, and then I've got like a zillion more uh, that people give me and stuff. And, and it's, it's hard to break into the rotation of your bag when you have so much confidence in what you're using. So, uh, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're back at the, yeah, yeah. Bit. Again, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you have so much room in your bag and I, I generally don't carry a large bag. I, I'll carry maybe eight plugs and, uh, you know, to break into that rotation, I mean, a plug is clearly going to be good. You know, I generally go with seven things I know, uh, I know how to use. And then based on the conditions, the eighth plug will be a niche plug. Something I really need to get out far, something like a, you know, uh, a, maybe a metal lip based on condition. It, it's usually the niche plug is based on conditions and it'll be something completely different from the rest of the plugs I have just in case, you know, I, I find fish or I just want to throw something different to see if they'll bite it. Because obviously you can't carry everything. Listen, I, I share your feelings on a needlefish. Needlefish is always the first lure out of my bag at night. I don't mm -hmm. care where I fish. Unless I'm fishing the inlet and the water's 20 feet deep and I got to get three ounce oh, yeah. bucktail yeah. to the bottom. Needlefish, I, I find it to be my fish seeking yeah. missile because... Uh, although dart is a great lure, especially around the inlets where there's a lot of current and, and, and on, on uh, sandbars and on rips, uh, I find that needlefish, 
I can do more with it. I can explore more of a water column with it, and I can cast it further. So uh, I'm not comparing one to another. What I'm saying is, for me, is my number one confidence plug when I and you know I'm not gonna go. Uh, you know I'm not gonna wake up at three o'clock in the morning, go to the beach, and throw my least confident plug in the water. It's not happening. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, insane. I feel, you got to be insane to feel, do that. It's like, I threw this shit. I've never done it before. Yeah, Why? Yeah, yeah. What, what were you thinking? You do that shit in the daytime. You don't yeah, do it in the middle yeah, of the night. Yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel the same way. You know, people want to test plugs, and I'm going, you know what? You know, when there's no fish around, that's the worst time to test a new plug. I says, you know what? If, yeah. if You know, when you got a good bite going, you know, and you got something new in the bag or somebody gives you a plug to try, that that's the time to try it. You know, uh, I agree you know, with when, you 100%. When, the fish is- when, when you catch a yeah, fish yeah. on every cast, you want to take that plug that you never caught a fish on and says, let me see what this thing does. And you know what? If it not catches at least as good as you were fishing, that thing's going right yeah, in your yeah, back because yeah, yeah. it's not obvious. And yeah, not yeah. I mean, you know to. what? You want to test something when fish are hot to trot. That's why I always talk it, you know? All right. Now, uh, wh- where I, I heard you working on a new book. This is, this is uh, what, coming maybe next year or so. I know you just started. Uh, it, it's yeah, yeah, it's. Um, you don't have to give me the details, no, I'll obviously, give you a but it's kind of exciting. About it. Um, it, you know, my my first book was more of a historic look at Block Island. I wanted to document the history of it, you know, and and I included information in there that's you know pertinent and still pertinent to this day. You know, and what you know what I what we all used out there, and a little bit of the history of all the different plugs and and how they evolved based on Block Island. And um, so what I wanted to do was to run a sequel to that book and maybe talk more about uh, current day Block Island, how the fishery has changed. Um, you know, we have a whole new generation of, of surf casters that are fishing now that kind of think the fishing that we have now is kind of normal. You know, um, this is like a normal thing to have a lot of little fish and not many big fish. And, you know, it's not really normal. And, but anyway, I I just wanted to kind of maybe expand on the island a little bit, uh, talk about current day tactics, um, how the fishery has changed, um, I also wanted to pay homage to some of the uh, other uh, other people that I met out there, and, and that over the years that uh, had helped me. and And I'm seeking uh, guest input from a couple different people um, to maybe have a you know a guest lecture or guest or a guest chapter series in the book. Um, I've reached out to a few people and they've expressed interest in doing it. I have a couple of friends of mine that are not necessarily uh, a big plug fisherman, but boy, they, they know how to chunk. And I've asked them to say, hey, you know what? You know, people don't hear about that aspect of the fishery. Um, you know, you guys are the experts. Let me know what you do. You know, you know what, what are your insights and observations? Um, I have uh, a, a chapter on on the freshwater fishing out there because I love fishing anyway, any kind of fishing. Yeah, I love fishing and I love the island and, and I'm trying to pay homage to the island and uh, and the people that have helped me out uh, over the years and to get, you know, experiences, memoirs from them along with my own writing. It's going to be a hodgepodge of stuff. And then I'm going to cover some of my my own island, my Aquidneck Island, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I'm going to give a little, you know, a little taste of, you know, my roots and and where I fish the rest of the year when I'm not out on Black Island, you know. Well, put me on a waiting list for that one. And uh, I know that your current book, The uh, surf, surf Casting Around Block, is available on Amazon. And also you have the... Uh, Facebook page? Yeah, there? it's 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 a surf ca- you know it's a Facebook page that I started to kind of promote the book, surf casting around the block, and and what 
what I do on that is periodically I write things. It's a good conversation. Yeah, yeah. It, I tell it, it you that much. It just gets people looking and, and uh, I always seek input from people there and say, hey, you know, what are your views on this? What are your views on that? You know, uh, I, I try to kind of, again, pay homage to the people I learn from. I, I always think it's a good idea that when you learn uh, something from somebody that you, uh, you give them credit. And I, I, you know, we, we all learn things from other people and very few things that we, we uh, learn, we learn on our own. And I always like to give credit to uh, the people that I, I was, uh, that I learned from and that, that were willing to take the time to teach me a little bit. I understand completely. I was fortunate enough to have a lot of people in my life who share their knowledge. And uh, to this day, I keep learning that I, I don't even feel like I scratched the surface yet, to be honest with you. I do want to thank you for joining us today and uh, sharing all your memories. And I do have something else that I want to talk to you about in another podcast. We're going to get over those big fish that you were part of for a certain amount of years that were written in your book. But uh, we'll leave that for another story and another time. And uh, I do thank you again for uh, joining us and sharing it. Oh, you know what? Zeno, it was my pleasure. We are grateful that you took time from your busy day to listen to the Surfcasters Journal Night Shift Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, we would love if you would share it with your fishing buddies and leave a rating and review to whatever app you use to listen to us. Your feedback and ratings help other surfcasters discover our podcast. Also check out our publication dedicated to surf fishing, Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com. Tight lines and good fishing.